Dr. Nicholas Lambert. He, is, uh, he has a very fascinating career, holds three degrees from Worcester College at Oxford University. You'll, you'll notice from his uh, accent, he is not from uh, the, coal, the coal regions of Northeast Pennsylvania where I went to college. Um, so he has those three degrees. He's a uh, prolific author. He is the author of his latest book is Planning Armageddon, British Economic Warfare in the First World War, published in 2012 by Harvard University Press. Before that, he's well known for Sir John Fisher's Naval Revolution, which won the Distinguished Book Prize from the Society for Military History. I know a lot of people here are involved in that organization. And he has a very uh, varied uh, professional experience uh, which probably allows him to conduct the kind of scholarship that he does. He has experience ranging from a visa officer in Mumbai, uh, India, for the U.S., to working with technology corporations uh, and research with think tanks, various uh, fellowships around the world, both in the United States and abroad. And uh, one of the difficult, or one of the more difficult issues, I think, is when people look at economics issues, uh, sometimes if you're strictly a political scientist or strictly a historian, sometimes you gloss over some things, but I think his professional experience brings further uh, credibility and further uh, nuance to the work that he does at the intersection of economics and strategy. So I'm delighted to announce uh, next speaker, Nicholas Lambert. Thank you. I'd like to begin, of course, by thanking uh, Mike Newman and FPRI uh, for inviting me here to uh, talk about a subject that I personally find fascinating. Oh, yes, turn on the microphone, probably a good idea. Um, that I find fascinating and actually I love. Um, and I also like, um, I've had three invitations to visit Cantini, and I've never been able to before come here. And I must say it's everything that I am told it is. It's a wonderful place, uh, remarkably peaceful. So. Um, and there was something that you mentioned in my introduction, something diversity and uh, differences of opinion. W was that sort of personally directed at me? That, <laughs> am I the token diversity, the token, um, uh, the, the, the controversial figure? I don't know. Or is everybody is tarred with the same brush? I'll just make a silly joke. Um, so, economic warfare is a uh, horribly vast and complicated subject. Um, it's this also a subject that generally generates a great deal of controversy, uh, provokes uh, strong emotions, and uh, very quickly invocations of ethical considerations. Um, I think that in wartime, one thing that makes uh, killing in wartime acceptable and not really an act of murder is when a distinction is drawn between combatants, i.e. soldiers, and non-combatants, especially women and children. Um, and this is rather difficult to do with economic warfare. Um, economic warfare tends to be extremely imprecise in its application, uh, not only in um, hurting non-combatants, but also um, producing very considerable uh, collateral damage to anybody and everybody who happens to be in the remotely close vicinity. Um, for many people, it's regarded as um, almost of, as a reversion to you know, medieval barbarism, uh, economic warfare. Um, that said, I mean, discussions and, uh, and the case studies that do exist of economic warfare tend to be, well, frankly, really rather poor. Um, there is a tendency very much to focus upon the military or the combat aspects of the subject um, to a lesser degree on the diplomatic, um, but to, uh, at the same time, to misconstrue the international legal aspects of the subject, which, of course, is another fiendishly difficult and dull subject, just like economics. Um, and minimize, uh, in particular, if not disregard, the numerous, uh, very complex, interconnected economic aspects. And I always find this rather ironic, because we're talking about economic warfare, and yet we don't really want to talk much about economics. Um, in an effort to keep my uh, talk to some manageable length and hopefully reasonable coherence, um, I'm going to uh, provide something of a case study uh, to focus on the German submarine campaign of the First World War which, of course, is intimately bound up in the U.S. decision uh, to enter the war in 1917. Um, it seems rather appropriate to do this because, of course, next month sees the 100th anniversary of the sinking of the Lusitania. So 
What I intend to do today is show how um, general understandings of uh, the US response to the German submarine warfare campaign have really been shaped by, um, and I emphasize general understandings, have been shaped by uh, a series of mistaken assumptions. Um, and really, time allows me just to focus on three of them. Um, first of all, I begin to begin with the US response to the Lusitania sinking. Um, I'm not going to deny the significance of the Lusitania sinking, uh, either in the US or anywhere else in the world, on the, on the contrary. Um, I'm merely going to suggest that in terms of economic warfare, its uh, significance has really hasn't been properly understood. Um, the second point is, is um, as I've already mentioned, um, whereas the military and diplomatic aspects of the subject are well enough understood, uh, this is especially not true for the economic considerations. And yet, you know, the economics of it are absolutely central, integral. I mean, they provide the necessary and vital context for indeed understanding the military, diplomatic, and various other considerations. You have to have economics and economic warfare. Um, the third uh, and final point, and in, in, in a way an extension of the, uh, the, the, the economics point, is that I want to review the importance of US economic interest groups uh, in shaping US policy um, in the early part of the First World War which again I think has uh, been wholly underestimated. And so if you want a precy or a gist um, of my argument that I propose to develop, it's going to be in short that I suggest that one needs to be very careful not to allow oneself to be um, captured by Wilson's rhetoric, uh, by President Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson's rhetoric, uh, that he is primarily driven by his own beliefs, his determination to uphold principles of international law, ethics, and humanity. Um, and uh, there was no consideration of interests, uh, you know, either national, party, or state. Um, to my mind, um, having looked at this subject, um, the U.S. government's ethical position was really shaped more by perceptions of U.S. Uh, essential U.S. economic interests than by adherence or otherwise to the law of nations. Um, just as the belligerents' ethical position was shaped by their perceptions of military necessity. And now, if you want to switch off and go to sleep, you know what the talk is about, and hopefully somebody next to you will be able to fill you in with these details. So I begin with the sinking of the Lusitania, not because I think um, historians' understanding of the US position on the German submarine warfare and economic warfare has tended to be shaped by the US response to the sinking of this most famous of four final passenger liners. Um, I mean, it has. Um, I mean, it's not unreasonable that it has shaped um, understandings because, to a very considerable degree, the sinking of the Lusitania on the 7th of May you know, indeed dominated Americans' own views of an understanding of German submarine warfare and economic warfare in general. Um, it, it really was a truly shocking event. Um, it's seen as a deliberate, by many, as a deliberate attack on passenger liner carrying women, children, and American citizens. Um, it was an atrocity, not an accident, and left an indelible impression on the minds of the American public. Um, I don't know, I was trying to think of examples, and I'm thinking of Apollo 11 landing, Kennedy assassination, Pearl Harbor attack. Lusitania is in the same category. I was alive for one of them, and remember it. Um, the sinking um, created a diplomatic and political crisis of the first order, literally, as it happened. Um, uh, Wilson's immediately asked, well, what are you going to do about it? And what does he do? He steps in and personally drafts the texts of the various US government notes to the German government. Um, and in these, and, and these initial notes that he sends, there's three of them, very much set the tone of the discussion between the US and Germany on the submarine warfare issue for the next uh, several years, uh, and indeed down to 1917. And in these notes, um, if you read them, um, they're quite short, remarkably short, um, but Wilson protested what he says is the recent violations of American rights on the high seas um, as absolutely contrary to the rules, the practices, and the spirit of modern warfare. And uh, he goes on and invokes the principles of justice and humanity. Um, he references rules of fairness, reason, justice, and humanity. Um, all of which, he says, modern opinion regards as uh, imperative. And um, you might think, well, who's he talking to? Is this uh, uh, platform uh, posturing? Uh, but, you know, his private pronouncements are equally, um, employ equally moralistic uh, rhetoric. They're la laced with talk of fundamental requirements of law, justice, and humanity. Um, but 
rhetoric about ethics was really only part of Wilson's response. Indeed, really what is striking about the Lusitania notes is the gap between Wilson's language and his actions. Um, the rhetoric is sweeping and dramatic and charged, um, really an accurate reflection of many Americans' shock and outrage at the, uh, at the event, as well as Wilson's own. Um, but you know, in terms of uh, the actions he took in defense of US interests, um, well, these were rather minimal. In fact, he only made three demands of the German government. First, cease using the submarine as a commerce raider. Second, disavow the act, say no, this was not our intention. And third of all, um, to what he says, observe American rights to travel safely over the seas. And um, I don't know anybody who's actually read these notes or knows what the, how, how the story develops, but basically the Germans simply ignore the first and the second. And to the third demand, uh, which really asks the least of them, uh, they suggested a compromise. And you know, why they, not unreasonably, refused to admit that American citizens can protect an enemy's ship uh, through mere fact of their presence on board. They did offer to meet the needs of US passengers or travelers by permitting, uh, they agreed to set up a, a, a number of um, safe routes and they were saying, we will allow certain liners to transit the war zone on fixed routes and a fixed timetable. Um, and, and they can even fly the British flag. We don't mind, just let us know what you want to do. Um, Wilson, however, rejected this practical proposition on the grounds that it compromised a principle and constituted, therefore, an abridgment and curtailment of US rights and, therefore, were an affront to US na national dignity and honor. Which rather leads us with the question, well, well, what did Wilson achieve? And um, I think, well, it really depends on one's perspective. Um, on the one hand, or one perspective, you know, he did achieve what he intended to set out to do, which was when he's asked by the, uh, a journalist who said, well, what do you intend to do about it? He actually uses this line. He says, no, well, I, I very much hope to maintain a firm front in respect to what we demand of Germany, and yet do nothing that might possibly involve us in the war. I think that's what's known as having your cake and eat it too. Um, you know, his powerful rhetoric and refusal to compromise on this travel question you know, held the firm front, while his retreat from the other two initial demands reduced the possibility of war. Um, but from another perspective, you know, he, you know, he, he, he really achieved nothing at all, um, nothing tangible or lasting. I mean, there is no more than a temporary modification of German behavior. Um, and the Lusitania did not result with any break from Germany because, I think, fearing he was treading on the road to war, Wilson compromised his most important demands. Um, and what can I say? He's a paradox. I mean, how much has been written about Woodrow Wilson and still there is no uh, resolution and probably never will be. Um, I think that both of these perspectives on what Wilson achieved do have truth to them. But I think that most historians have tended to focus on the first uh, rather than the second. And in so doing, they have not, I think, um, sufficiently probed the problems with Wilson's appeal to international law and universal justice, or with his attempt to enshrine uh, the unlimited right of Americans to travel through a war zone as a principle of either or both. Um, nor really have they adequately grasped the uncertainties of international maritime law in the World War I era. Um, it does not help either that if you read Wilson's correspondence, it seems that he really rather struggled to grasp on this point, and he had to be constantly reminded by his advisors. So if you look at some of the earlier drafts of uh, the, the US government note uh, in response to the Sussex incident, which was in early 1916, uh, Wilson tried to demand of the German government that the imperial government should now immediately declare its intention to abandon its present practices of submarine warfare and return to the scrupulous observance of the practices clearly prescribed by the war law of nations. Um, to which his uh, Secretary of State, then Robert Lansing, correctly pointed out that, um, well, maritime law comprised of very few principles and none of them were at all clearly subscribed, for that section was struck out. And we'll talk a bit more about this in a minute. Um, so in a sense, I suppose, um, historians are quite right to present Wilson as a sincere in his moralism and his insistence upon the right to travel, um, which, as I say, sets the tone for all future US tussles with Germany over the submarine issue, um, from the Arabic case in 1915, Sussex, spring 16, through to 1917, with, of course, the breaking of diplomatic relations on the 2nd of February and the decision for war on the 2nd or 6th of April. Um, but I think that there's much more to the story, uh, much more going on in the background, uh, because Wilson, in, in addition to being um, a sincere uh, individual, was also something of a very shrewd politician. 
and a US statesman, and he is, of course, sensitive to the desires of his domestic constituents. So now, um, the second point I'm going to talk about is something relating to global economics. And if we sort of, you know, granting that Wilson uh, genuinely believed, for better or worse, that he was motivated principally by considerations of justice rather than self-interest, let us now turn to exploring these economic interests, first the global and domestic, which shaped Wilson and his administration's response to the Lusitania affair, not just, but also indeed to Germany's campaign of um, submarine warfare and to economic warfare more broadly. Um, I think before we begin, I suppose we ought to understand, we need to be very clear what we mean by the uh, term economic warfare. Now, that is not easy to define. Um, there is a, uh, uh, economic warfare is rather a catch-all term to cover anything connected with economics. And uh, I don't think it's too profitable to uh, try and sort of argue or debate or propose any particular definition. Um, I, I think a typical working definition may be that economic warfare constitutes attacking an enemy economy with the object of undermining his capacity to wage war. Well, that just covers absolutely everything, doesn't it? Um, it's, um, it, it's a horribly unspecific and, frankly, not very terribly useful uh, definition. Uh, really, if you want to understand economic warfare at any particular time in history or any place, you really have to grasp the full precise mechanisms of pressure that are supposed to be applied and how they're supposed to work. Um, so very much depends, um, so much of what is done or what is intended to be done depends upon the structure of the global economic system that uh, exists at that particular time. Um, so to put it another way, we need to be very clear not only what is being attacked and why, but where the pressure points on the enemy economy are perceived to lie. And really, to do this, you need to understand something of the world economic uh, system as it existed at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and really reflect upon the fact that uh, don't uh, forget, and I won't list them or go into them here, but remember the dramatic changes in the structure of the world economic system during the 19th century. Um, so, turn of the 20th century, what are we in? We're, we're in the, this is the first age of globalization, which I broadly define as 1870 to 1914. And uh, if anybody's interested in Q&A or afterwards, you know, we can deba debate um, industrialization and urbanization and you know, the impact of cable communications on business practices and perceptions of time and distance. Uh, but you know, my experience is, is that most people for some odd reason, aren't as fascinated as I in the workings, the intricacies of international credit systems. Uh, uh, so we should stick to basics, um, which for our purposes, for the purposes of this lecture, there are two. Um, first, in the area of globalization, the political stability of nations has become far more dependent than previously upon continued access to the international trading system. At the most basic physical level, societies grew less of their own food and imported more from across the oceans. Um, you have urbanized populations that sold their labor for wages to purchase this imported food. And the purchase of their labor, uh, that is fully economic employment, really depends upon very high levels of global economic activity. Um, the wage earning, in addition, you've got a range of factors. And one of the more, one, one of the more important ones is you know, the wage earning middle and working classes increasingly want to spend their money not just on food, but luxury food items. Uh, which would be classed as sugar, which would be classed as coffee. You see, I mean, you sort of take away someone's cup of tea in the morning or their cup of coffee, and you get a very unhappy population very quickly. Um, cut off a few other items too, and you've got an out-and-out you know, out out rebellion on your hands. At least uh, this is what a lot of people feared. Um, and, and increasing numbers of these people, of course, are getting the vote, uh, with it the ability to cause political, apply political pressure, or potentially cause political instability if their appetites, as it were, for food and these luxuries are not met. Um, at this time, again, you know, during this period, by the turn of the 20th century, trade is constituting roughly now 20 to 30% 20, 20 of GDP, depends on the country, um, and it really depends on the measure you're using. But the point is, is that the UK, and especially to the lesser extent Germany, as is well known, is dependent upon imported foods and raw materials. Um, and so, you know, what, in summary, what I'm saying is, is that globalization has made modern industrial societies more dependent than previously upon high levels of economic activity for their own economic prosperity and, indeed, their social political stability. And although you could argue that the U.S. is less dependent than most upon global trade, there are key sectors in the U.S. economy that are just, uh, well, they're part of the world system. Uh, pricing is determined by the world price, and they are exposed to the world markets. 
Um, you know, as it were, the, the US is very much in the same boat. Um, the second basic point about the global world, globalized world economic system I want to mention is, is that um, you know, it was characterized by complexity. Um, industries are interlinked and supply chains so supply chains you know, extend between industries and indeed across national boundaries. So you know, Henry Ford's motor vehicles require rubber tires. Uh, where does the rubber come from? Yeah, well, Malaysia mostly, but Ceylon a little bit coming out. But the point is, is that you know, effectively, this is a step in the Ford's famous uh, assembly line. In a sense, you know, getting rubber to Detroit really rather depends upon the smooth functioning global trading system. Um, you know, the point being is national e economies are very, very interdependent uh, to a very uh, remarkable degree. Um, and, then, and then the other thing to get across is, again, you know, it's very difficult to, to explain this, but econo economies are fundamentally dynamic, not st static organisms, and they're constantly changing and growing in one direction, retreating in others. And, and one ha that's, a, that's a key point to keep in mind, is, is that how dynamic an economy is. And uh, this is rather important for economics too, uh, economic warfare. Um, so when we talk about 20th century economic warfare, we should in fact be less interested in studying the interdiction of uh, stocks of physical goods, and much more focused on examining the impact upon the national economic machine, as it were. Um, um, and you're looking at dislocating and deranging the system, the linkages between, within the economic system. Um, and, and in 20th century economic warfare, the aim isn't really to sort of shut off the supply of a particular product or good. It really is to impede the flow. Um, and, uh, and, and, and again, it, it can be done in several ways. It's not just a question of stock is, uh, stopping a cargo of goods going into a particular port, um, the, 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 the physically interdicting the goods, as it were. What you can do is you can disrupt the information flows. Now, parallel to the actual goods themselves is a flow of information going through a cable uh, relating to finance, insurance, um, uh, banking, uh, delivery. All this information is flowing down a cable. You could just as effectively stop the flow of goods or impede the flow of goods by stopping the information flow as you can by stopping the goods. In fact, it's a good deal easier in some respects. Um, I could go on. I mean, you're, you're, really what you're attempting to do uh, um, is, is, is um, provoke uh, changes in relative prices within an economy um, and generate inflation and a panic, panic the population. Um, you know, so, uh, the, the net effect is you're trying to generate deliberately um, an economic downturn, but very quickly, you know, and, and effectively slowing economic activity indeed leads to the loss of output and unemployment, and a serious downturn, as everybody knows, can lead to high unemployment and social unrest. And really, this is what the aim of economic warfare is, is to produce this, you know, to deliver this shock to the economic system, the enemy economic system, um, uh, on such a scale that you're going to provoke econ uh, social unrest and therefore political pressure. Um, this is the idea, or one of the ideas. Um, and uh, nowhere more dangerous, by the way, than messing with the food supply, because that really is undermining the claim of the state or the legitimacy of the state. Uh, it's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, but so fundamentally, therefore, I suppose, is that 20th century economic targets is the society itself, not the state. Now, traditionally, economic warfare um, tends to target the state, it, it specifically excise revenues. Uh, the idea being is, is that you undermine the flow of revenue. Uh, to the state that uh, prevents them from buying all the um, items they require in their domestic economy. Uh, but this is not what's attempted in the uh, 20th century economics uh, warfare. Um, as early as 1856, really, they, 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 they've identified that you can't effectively target an enemy state. So really what you're endeavouring to do is to target the society in order to get the society to pressure and induce um, its state to change policy, or maybe even regime change. Um, there is, um, again, a, a, another factor in all this is there is this very widespread, remarkably widespread perception of this fragility in this new economic system that they'd created in the 19th century and fragility in the societies. Um, this notion of uh, fundamental weakness in modern economies and social systems is very widely discussed in the 1890s. Um, very, uh, most famous example is Ivan Bloch. Um, are people familiar with Ivan Bloch's work? Polish financier, banker. Uh, sort of a bit like their, um, well, I don't know who he's like. Um, it's, uh, he's a uh, Carnegie, I suppose, would be a, a, an appropriate uh, a comparison. You know, Ivan Bloch and Norman Angel 
Uh, there's you know, leading economists like Robert Giffen. Uh, anyone familiar with Robert Giffen? Uh, anyone, economics, upward sliding demand curves? Robert Giffen, lies, damn lies and statistics. Robert Giffen, yeah. It wasn't um, somebody else, but it was Robert Giffen who actually, 1892 paper, he used the phrase. He's quite well known. Um, and um, there's another one in the United States, one called Alfred Thayer Mahan. You may be surprised to know that uh, he is, if in his later works, he is very interested in economic warfare and the implications of war upon economic systems and social stability. Uh, in fact, he gets into a blazing row with uh, Teddy Roosevelt uh, in about 1905, while Roosevelt's president. And uh, of course, as you know, both of them had written wars on the War of 1812. And let's just say Mahan's correspondence is saying, well, I've come to a new opinion on this or a new, new understanding, and Roosevelt doesn't like it. And they, uh, there's a wonderful exchange of correspondence with them. Um, but I digress. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and indeed, you know, strands of these thoughts of fragility uh, can be detected in earlier works. You know, John Stuart Mill, uh, Karl Marx, Friedrich Engels. Um, so what I'm saying is, by the turn of the 20th century, you know, judging by the contents of periodicals of the period discussing contemporary affairs, the debate over this fragility in the world economic system has become remarkably widespread. Um, and traces of it can be found in the, you know, the American economic theorists that emerged in the 1890s. Um, Charles Conant, Arthur Hadley, uh, Jeremiah Jenks, uh, leading economists of the day in the United States. Um, anyway, what's the point of all this? Um, well, the point is, is that really both Germany and Britain come up with strategies to exploit this perceived vulnerability, not surprising, in anticipation of war. And although there are major differences in understanding and in, in, in approach, um, both of them are really recognizing that this economic warfare is a strategic weapon, and it's a very dangerous one. You know, it's, it, it's not a weapon of precision. In many ways, it's a weapon of mass destruction. Uh, and they knew there were going to be high levels of collateral damage uh, because if you're deranging deliberately, I mean, you, you basically what you're attempting to do with economic warfare is channel natural economic forces, um, ideally away from your own economy and more to the enemy's economy. Um, but um, it's a very, very dangerous game because um, it impacts everybody in at once. I mean, anybody who is connected to the global economic trade system is at once, uh, is a stakeholder and is at once also in, uh, imperiled. And, and, and what's more, these leaders, particularly in Britain, they had the most uh, advanced and the earliest understanding of economic warfare. They knew it, and they knew it had to be quick, and it had to be make, you know, use it ruthlessly and decisively before neutral protests begin to start coalescing. Um, so now we sort of turn to the last section, which is this notion of economic self-interest um, guiding or influencing uh, US policy during this period. Well, I think the importance of US uh, economic interest groups, as I said in my, uh, in my opening remarks, have um, been wholly underestimated, um, the extent to which they shape US policy. Uh, as I say, I, I think that uh, it is too easy to be captured by Wilson's rhetoric, that he's driven by his own, primarily by his own beliefs, rather than the interests of you know, nation, party, and state. And that uh, what Wilson and indeed the US government is presenting as universally morally true are in fact really rather reflections of their perceptions of economic and political self-interest. So uh, what happens? In August 1914, Wilson is confronted by a domestic economic crisis of the First Order uh, caused by the outbreak of the First World War. And it's being exacerbated by this British economic warfare strategy that Britain has sort of unleashed in early part of August. Um, the very first country that's really nearly destabilized uh, by the British action is, in fact, the United States. Um, and um, there's a number of ways, but you know, the, the key sector in the US economy at this particular time, in particular, the, if you know when cotton's har har harvested, um, is cotton. Um, c cotton is the key sector in the US economy. And it's also one of the most dependent upon export, and thus upon the smooth functioning of the global economic system, which has just you know, been wrecked. Um, it's also the chief source of foreign exchange for the United States. So if the U.S. wants to remain on the gold standard, it better fix that problem too. So it's critical also to the entire U.S. banking system. Um, and, but in addition to its economic importance, which is pretty obvious, cotton has, a, what should we say, an outsized political importance. Um, it's the basis of the U.S. southern economy. And the South, of course, is the basis of the Democratic Party. And the South has uh, many representatives in Congress devoted to protecting the interests of cotton. And um, in Woodrow Wilson, they have both a Southerner and a Democrat in the White House, uh, who's very mindful of the upcoming midterm elections, by the way. 
Um, and as an elected leader of a nation whose real economic health depends substantially upon supporting the cotton trade, and as a politician who really rather depends upon the votes of the cotton south, um, it is certainly Wilson's interests, and you know, arguably his responsibility, um, to seek the free export of cotton upon which the US, particularly the south, depends. Um, I don't know, incidentally, if anybody knows how the British actually did it, how, what they did to the US cotton trade. They didn't actually announce it was going to be contraband. They just simply said, we're not going to finance it, we're not going to insure it, and we're not going to ship it. And that was enough to shut the entire cotton system down. I mean, ports were clogged full of the stuff. Railway sidings um, from uh, I think Galveston and uh, some other southern ports, they were, the railways refused to touch it. They didn't know where to put it. It was everywhere. You couldn't move for bales of cotton. Um, uh, what's the impact upon price? I mean, price in July 31st, um, I think the, the price opens at three and a quarter. And within 70 minutes, it's gone below nine. And they shut the exchange. Half the brokers in New, in New Orleans Cotton Exchange are bankrupt. And uh, over the next couple of months, it goes below five. Well, you think about that. Uh, you, you know, just that's, well, it, uh, again, I could uh, go on. Um, now, the, 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 what I really need to emphasize is the importance of cotton and of trade is very clearly understood by all of Wilson's senior advisors in foreign affairs matters. I mean, you just read the memoranda by Robert Lansing, uh, Williams Jennings Bryant, who's a very impressive mind. Uh, I know he comes across, sometimes I read books, and he, he's presented something as a buffoon, but uh, you read how closely reasoned his, some of his memoranda are on the subject, and they're very, very impressive. Um, McAdoo, Treasury Secretary, uh, of course, Colonel House. Um, all of these men have left memoranda that show they very clearly understood the, very, the worrying implications for the US economy consequent to the outbreak of war, and they were quite determined to take action. And uh, this is an interesting um, sort of, as, almost as an aside, you know, if they're not talking about economic interests in uh, May 1915 and beyond, it's because I think by this time it's become an unspoken assumption. And yet if you look in the period August 14 to April 15, it's all about economics. Uh, and these, 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 but the issues never go away, they're never solved. And they, I would argue, they continue to shape US policy. Um, and indeed, you know, in his memoirs, Robert Lansing, as I say, Secretary of State, actually admits that loss of property is really just as important to the US as loss of citizens, and arguably more so, but it makes for much better press if you focus on citizens being killed um, uh, than anything else. So, so what I'm trying to say is you can't really start with the Lusitania if you want to really understand where US policy is going. Um, which gets to the whole question of, um, you know, in making my last point, I suppose, I say, I'm going to bring this back to the beginning. Uh, Wilson's pleased that his actions are justified, merely the exercise of neutral rights as prescribed under the law of nations, uh, based upon universally accepted principles of justice. Uh, I mean, these are far more problematic than is generally realized. Um, with the emergence of this new world economic system that I'm talking about in the 19th century, and, and what you might call the forces of globalization. Now, this had a very profound effect on international maritime law. Um, and, and really, the most simple way to understand it is this. I mean, in, if I'm going to summarize, it's you know, the principles and precedents of international maritime war governing the conduct of war at sea are developed in the 18th century. And they're based upon an 18th century understanding of how trade was conducted in the 18th century and how economies was economies functioned in the 18th century. Um, post-1870, um, there really is um, a steadily widening uh, and very serious a disconnect between the principles of international maritime law and the actual day-to-day -day commercial practices. And what's fascinating is, is that the, you know, the pre-war lawyers were warned of this, at the, the Hague and the Declaration of London, uh, the, 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 the Conference of London, they were warned about this, and the lawyers were going, well, not our problem, change it back again. Uh, they really weren't interested in the practicalities and to, to an extraordinary degree. Um, uh, they don't pretend to understand it all. Um, anyway, so um, the, 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 there is, I mean, under international law, and I'll just give, um, I think time permits me one example. You know, it, it's assumed that um, you know, they, they place far, most, far, far too much trust, trust in the papers that existed on the ships, except they didn't exist. Uh, and it's assumed that the ownership of a merchantman or a cargo is very simple to establish and that the um, and uh, the destination of any particular ship is e easy to establish, but that isn't actually correct at all. Um, by the 20th century, you know, well, I should start with the beginning. You know, at the beginning of time, uh, a ship loads a cargo, a particular port, and then proceeds to a known destination. It knows where it's going. It's not just going to widely sail into the great blue yonder. 
and you know, decide where it's going to offload its cargo. Um, it's, uh, they, they, they're, they're liners, they're running on fixed routes, and they're going from A to B. Um, but unfortunately, this isn't actually true much at the, uh, particularly for bulk commodities at the turn of the 20th century. What you have now is, is that you have ships loading up with a bulk commodity, let's say wheat, and, and loading in New York, and then they sort of proceed out of the harbor, and they turn left at the Statue of Liberty and start chugging across the Atlantic, and they don't actually have an ultimate intended destination. They get within wireless range of, uh, of Europe, and then their instructions are received from their home office, right, the best price available for this cargo is in Germany, or it's in France, or it's in Britain, and they proceed, yes, on instructions once they've actually tr crossed the Atlantic. Now, there's another level of complication in that you've got, um, you know, you've got credit at markets and resale. You know, uh, the ownership of the cargo can change hands three or four times in the, uh, in the course of a voyage. Uh, maybe more. Um, and uh, really, what, what, what this really means is, is that um, you know, um, you know, effectively two practical legal pillars of blockade lord, uh, law, um, knowledge of ownership and ultimate destination, have just disappeared. And, and this is the problem confronting all statesmen during the First World War that deal with any issues connected with economics, trade, and economic warfare. The international law isn't there. At least it is there, but it doesn't bear any relationship to the reality of how business is actually transacted. And that's a problem. Um, so um, the inapplicability and you know, practical irrelevance of international law is actually seen much more clearly in the US response to the original British economic warfare campaign, which is very different. They, they, had, they started off with an economic warfare campaign in, in August 1914. And it's probably the only strategic plan in history that's been called off because it was too successful. Uh, they were hurting everybody, and uh, business interests, particularly in the UK, were screaming very loudly that they were losing money. And uh, they were joined in by most other business interests around the world. Um, in you know, most diplomatic histories, you will see the suggestion that the US somehow acquiesced in an illegal British blockade of Germany that stood up to the illegal German retaliatory measures, which was declaring the war zone around the British Isles. Um, and uh, you know, at so many levels, this just isn't correct. Um, in actuality, what happens is, is the US refuses to permit Britain to enforce her maritime rights to cut off the flow of contraband to her enemy because the collateral de damage caused to the US economy is just too devastating. Um, I'm not saying, um, you know, I mean, I'll admit that the British government did in fact succumb to the temptation to uh, ignore one or two rules that they were found to be what you might call exasperatingly inconvenient. Uh, but you know, this is just nothing more than tradition. All great powers that go to war do this sort of thing. But by and large, um, uh, the British policy is within sight of you know, the principles of international law, the best they were, were able to do. Um, but as I say, the problem is the British action, and, uh, which is just to exacerbate the economic chaos of 1914, um, is hurting key US interests, cotton, oil, copper, and meat are the, uh, are the principal ones, and seriously hurting them too. Um, in the 20th century, there are three great economic downturns. And anybody care to say which, will, you know, wh when are they? Two of them are very well known, and the other one is forgotten. Well, you, know, you could say 2008 is a major economic downturn. You could say 1929 or 1931, depending on the definition of downturn. When's the big one? 1914 is the big one. It shuts down the world economic system. I mean, the US stock exchange is shut. Uh, there's no foreign exchange. The place is, the uh, shutters are up. There's no ships at sea. Um, I could go on. It's, it is the great economic downturn of the, uh, of the 20th century. Um, and um, anyway, as I say, so uh, key US interests are being hurt, and there's midterm elections coming up. And so what the, what the US government does is that it presses Britain remarkably hard. I mean, Wilson is ruthless in enforcing, um, um, uh, or standing up for American rights, if you prefer, or American interests is a better word. Um, and, and, and they press the British extremely hard to call off their economic warfare strategy, um, which for other reasons as well, um, like uh, domestic British companies also moaning. Uh, they actually do so in September 1914. And so subsequently in the fall of 1914, British and American diplomats get together and they forge this compromise and to agree to a set of rules to govern what became known as the blockade. Um, in other words, British policy change is substantially an accommodation of US interests. 
uh, the ability to sell to both sides. Um, and it's achieved largely at the expense uh, of most of the other neutrals as well. Um, so, you know, in a sense, the US is just as much and arguably more responsible for any departures in customary usage uh, from the law of nations uh, than anybody else. And indeed, I mean, the, 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 um, the, uh, the body of law or the codification of law, which is supposed to represent and articulate um, international maritime law, is something called the Declaration of London. Which nation is the first to violate the Declaration of London? Can you guess this? The United States. It was uh, Article 56, uh, because it was found very, because the US didn't have a merchant marine at all. Uh, there were a tiny number of ships. 15 ships were plying the Atlantic. There were totally 198 ships in the entire US merchant marine that were ocean going. Most of those were in the Pacific. So you had 15 ships. And so Williams Jennings Wright says, well, all these German liners have run to cover in, uh, there were over a thousand of them. Um, uh, they've run to neutral ports, most of them in the US, so they just said, well, we're going to reflag them and hoist the stars and stripes on them. And the response of the Everest Entente was, you can't do that against international law. And they just said, just watch us. Um, but that's another story. Um, so, um, no, Germany's campaign of economic warfare against Britain, this is my final remark, you know, unrestricted submarine cam, uh, submarine warfare is very much shaped by these same assumptions of how the world works and how the economy works how the global economic system works, and, and indeed by many of the same wartime imperatives. Um, and like Britain's um, campaign of economic warfare, it caused very significant collateral damage to the US economy. Not quite as bad, I think, but anyway. But, and Americans reacted in much the same outrage. You know, what right did either belligerent have to injure the interests of a neutral? Well, that's fair enough. Um, the US wasn't at war, and why shouldn't it be able to tr trade as it sees fit? which is to say with both sides. Um, and unsurprisingly, the belligerent perspective was somewhat different, you might say. Um, you know, what right did the US have to avoid the suffering of war while at the same time seeking to make a profit out of it? Uh, what right did the US have to insulate its own economy from the war while prolonging the war effectively uh, by trading with both sides? Um, you know, from the belligerent's perspective, the US was, as I said, one of my favorite sayings, having its cake and eating it too. You know, if it wants to carry on in wartime as it had in peacetime and so turn a profit in the war, then well, fine, but it has to take the risks, go with it. But if it wants to avoid the risks, then it has to avoid or at least reduce the rewards they're getting out of it. Um, now, what um, seemed incredibly unreasonable to both British and Germans, it seems to me, is um, to assert the unlimited right of Americans to travel and trade however they wished, including on British merchant ships carrying munitions of the British war effort, and then try and present these rights as a matter of universal justice rather than national self-interest. Um, yeah, so was there really an alternative? And I think, well, yes, there was, of course. There's some precedent for this. As we know, Thomas Jefferson's uh, Non-Intercourse Act of 1809, uh, which is, uh, that really is genuine and honest idealism, is it not? But it unfortunately also, um, yeah, it's certainly, yeah, you could say he, um, he failed in his responsibilities to his own society and he wrecked the entire US economy, uh, which really just brings us back to the point that waging economic warfare is a horribly complicated business. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll take questions. Gary Morris will lead us off once again. <laughs> um, actually, in her, in her uh, discussion about the economic warfare, but I want to bring us up into the current period of time. Um, is there any connection that could be made between um, organizations that are working now in the world as far as, you know, the situation, especially in the Middle East, uh, where the, like, Saudi Arabia and Iran um, are com not only committing religious warfare, but are also doing economic warfare to gain control over the region? Well, that's an incredibly broad question and one that's very difficult to answer. I mean, um, I suppose yes, and was it not ever thus? It just really depends. We're getting back into what do we mean by economic warfare? What constitutes economic warfare? So uh, if, for instance, there's a campaign in the United States to not buy Chinese goods, is that economic warfare? From a certain perspective, it is. So 
So where do you draw the line? And uh, so I, what I'm trying to say is, is that one needs to be a lot more specific in one's understanding of particularly what is attempting to be um, accomplished and why and the mechanisms. Um, as I say, this j you can't, uh, it's very difficult to apply a large blanket to cover everything. Um, it just, uh, you know, if you're trying to understand what's going on, you really get that need to get down into nitty, nitty gritty details, which is difficult. Uh, Scott Wilson, Omaha Central High School, Nebraska. Uh, sorry. I'll have a oh, then the, uh, <laughs> what's your name? Sorry. Sean Connor, Liberty High School, Eldersburg, Maryland. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Lambert. The recent cyber attack on Sony Corporation by North Korea has led them to comment that for the better part of two decades, the United States has conducted unrestrained economic warfare against North Korea. And their response has been mm -hmm. to bolster their internet presence. How would you react to that statement by North Korea? And furthermore, does it, is this a game changer where now economic warfare may move to a different level between nations based on their global position? Um. Well, first of all, I should preface my remarks by saying I'm really a historian and an economist. So I know what I don't know about what happened 100 years ago. Um, but if I employ the same model that I used to sort of do my own research from events 100 years ago, I know what I would need to know um, to make uh, an informed, uh, form an informed opinion on that particular subject. And I'm painfully aware of what I don't know, um, because of largely it's secret. Um, I suppose a short answer to that question would be, well, it really depends on, again, on your definition of economic warfare. What is legitimate economic warfare? Uh, what isn't legitimate economic warfare? Is or economic warfare legitimate? It's just a very difficult uh, to pose that particular question and expect a reasonably coherent answer, which sounds like it's dodging the question. I'm very painfully aware of that, and I don't mean to do that. I'm just saying is it's difficult to start from that particular point and go further. Yes, I mean, from a certain perspective, you could, you could argue that the American actions against North Korea have been, you know, they've been embargoing certain commodities and certain products. That's economic warfare. But is it intended to do achieve what? Regime change? Destabilization of the re regime? Well, that's another characteristic of economic warfare. So I suppose you could argue that. But again, as I've remarked, you know, it is ever thus. Uh, it has always been that way. Um. Brenda Bola, Tucson, Arizona. Well, I guess my question is even more broad. Um, I don't understand the value of cake unless you eat it. Um, if you were to define economic warfare as any um, economic policy or strategy designed to coerce or force a course yes. of action, Yes. And that would include all sorts of things. Precisely. Uh, sanctions, pricing strategies yes. like Saudi Arabia is doing with oil today. Yep. Um, I think you're not going to answer my question. Let's <laughs> see. <laughs> but what would you say as a historian has um, incurred more casualties? Economic warfare, um, as I just broadly yeah. defined it, or military action? Over what time period? Um, since post-World War II? I'm going to dodge that question. I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I would think, I mean, really, so for instance, the, uh, uh, to what extent were the number of casualties in the um, post-World War I uh, flu, Spanish flu epidemic caused by the malnutrition of, I mean, where do you draw the line? Yes, do you, do you, do you see where I'm going with that particular line of argument? I mean, they, you know, they were un under or man they're suffering from malnutrition. They're particularly, therefore, um, more vulnerable to the Spanish flu epidemic. Is that attributable to economic warfare, or is that just sheer bad luck because they got flu and died? I'd, I'd call that collateral. Yes. Um, and they're, unintended and, consequences. And it certainly is unintended because they could never imagine that the um, you know, Spanish... But the sanctions against North Korea were certainly intentional. Yes. But I, again, I'm yeah. not seeing a very easy way to uh, draw hard and fast lines uh, around that particular question. Or I'm not seeing the parameters upon which I can come up with an easy answer. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's, it, it's a very, as I say, it's a horribly difficult subject. Thank you. 
Bruce Damasio, Towson University. As a quasi-economist, thank you for that. But I have a question. The Lusitania was a fortuitous accident or a terrible blunder, depending on how you look at it. Had they sped up instead of hitting a fog bank, they would have missed them by two hours. Had they not stopped to deliver mail to the packet ships outside New York, you would have missed them. It took 23 months after the Lusitania, despite its impact on the public, for the U.S. to go to war. Mm -hmm. Had that sinking not occurred, other than the Zimmerman telegram, would there have been another catalyst that you think would have sparked the reaction economically in the U.S. to get them to go to war? And again, another very difficult question, because first of all, the Lusitania wasn't an in, it's a, it, it, it's, it, it's a, uh, you could put it under the category of submarine warfare. It's not easy to categorize it as economic warfare, is it? So, but is, you know, so then which, which case we're talking about the significance of the loose tenure upon the US political process and the willingness for war. And then I would have said, I, I would divide that into two questions. I think that, um, yes, there'd probably be another cat catalyst, but, um, but I think the more important answer would be is just that really war isn't a monolithical category. That there's various grades of war. To what extent would the US gone in and the level of commitment would they put into the war? That is a much more uh, um, difficult question to answer. And I think that uh, you know, Lusitania helps them to go in with a higher level of commitment and to you know, pass conscription act in, 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 in the United States. Uh, I, would, I would sort of develop an answer on those lines. Thank you. Uh, Ami Prakash, uh, Brooklyn, New York. Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm trying to think of ways to perhaps integrate economic warfare into the classroom. Um, and I was thinking for, for high school students, sometimes you, you don't have to hit them over the head with it, but, but it has to be a bit more obvious um, than your very, very subtle and sophisticated talk. Um, so I was wondering, as an example, what, what you would think about Nasser's nationalization of the Suez Canal uh, as an example of perhaps, you know, obviously putting a, it's a choke point for the international economy. Um, it's also, of course, an act of sort of anti-colonial nationalism in the era of decolonization. Um, I was wondering if you would think that that would be a good example for classroom use as an example of economic warfare. Thank you. What is, it, what is the, obje I mean, is the objective to pressure what I, I would start with what was NASA's objectives in achieving this. Was he considering uh, you know, the consequences and the impact on the international training system, such as it existed in, what, 1950s? Uh, there wasn't too much, well, it was just starting up again. Uh, but it certainly has that impact. I wouldn't have thought that would be my first choice of an example. But uh, again, it's, uh, we're coming back to this point about how do you define economic warfare. Yeah, I mean, I th I, if my understanding is correct, the, the rationale for the act is because of economic reasons as well, because he's not getting the, the loans from the Americans to build the dam he wants, right? So, and if you can demonstrate that that was his intent, then yes, I would think you have much stronger argument. Okay. Um, I suppose there's one other point I, that I didn't make in my talk nearly sufficiently is that, um, how do I put this? Um, Business interests um, being damaged are in every country. Uh, one of the biggest untold scandals of the war is the fact that, uh, well, as I said in my talk, you know, the US uh, or the Americas generally is making a fortune selling to both sides. And, uh, but the question is, how did it get there? And the answer is, well, an awful large percentage of it, more than half, is financed by the city of London. And it's carried in British ships. I mean, it's, there's no question of it. I mean, the Allies or the Entente control 80% of the lift capacity across the Atlantic. So it couldn't have got there any other way. Now, American banks don't have uh, corresponding bank networks in Europe. They're not allowed to do that until, what is it, 19, there's a 1913 Act, a Federal Reserve Act, and then it's the 1916 Act. I'm desperately trying to remember it, and I can't remember it, but they're allowed to own um, overseas, um, overseas branches. Um, they don't have the network, so the banking networks don't exist. Uh, British com cable companies control 80% of global communications. Uh, 
global network. Um, and across the Atlantic, they've got a lock on it. Um, how else do you conduct trade unless you're using the British infrastructure of trade? So I'm just saying is, is that business interests are in all countries are um, uh, the business of business is what the bottom line is the bottom line and business is business in every country and you have very powerful interest groups in all the countries and so any economic warfare strategy has to take that into consideration you can't help your own interest you sort of it's got to be quick and painless uh, but it rarely is and you've got to hold your nerve which of course the British failed to do entirely um, does that sort of what I do, I, that's what I'm trying to communicate is there is this it's not just a question of nation state to nation state uh, you, know, you have this, um, as I say, this business community. And whereas in, before 1914, I think you could say most companies were, had a sort of, some sort of national identity. They were headquartered in a particular country. Um, so a British company, maybe, I don't know, uh, the uh, Eastern Telegraph Company is, is a London company. But you know, as the war goes on, 1916, these, um, international companies are changing their nature. They're becoming much more, instead of being you know, national, inter, you know, national companies, they become international corporations. Uh, the amount of capital flight out of Britain in 16 is staggering. Um, I was just giving an example to somebody um, at, at lunchtime of uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the shenanigans, actually it was a bit earlier, um, of the shenanigans that would go on. I mean, if you were a British company and you owned Class A, uh, U.S. securities, so U.S. deal or anything like that, the British government would try and sort of say, well, we'll have those, thank you. Here, have some British government bonds. And if you think the war is not going to turn out too well for the British state, then you don't particularly want these, and you'd much rather have your U.S. securities. So uh, companies would literally physically move and reincorporate overseas, and they would act like uh, corporations, and their loyalty is no longer to the individual nations, but it's to, um, it's to uh, themselves their corporate entity and their shareholders, their stockholders, or whatever you perceive it to be. Um, sorry, that was a, a sidebar uh, annex to my uh, talk. Uh, it's Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, James Tucker, uh, Washington, Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, two questions. One is you, you touched upon it uh, a little bit already, um, but related to the growth of transnational companies over time, I was wondering how that has, if you could talk on how that's altered, possibly, the um, foreign policy among nation states um, in terms of how there's business interest, the international uh, interest of the business, I guess, how that's, if that's affected at all. More contemporary. Yeah, uh, so um, post-World War I. Um, and um, change that dynamic. I, I haven't done the work on that, and more to the point, not many other people have. Yeah. We don't know. And, and plus the fact it's extremely difficult. I mean, the British government had this huge organization trying to, they, they were literally, uh, the, their solution to the problem was to police just about every transaction uh, into and out of Europe. And they had that sort of information. The information requirement for that is staggering. No, before computers. And they had card index systems with a number of, you know, 1.5 million indexes, uh, cards, uh, index cards in the card index. Uh, you're just trying to think of managing that information. And let's just say they devoted an enormous number of resources to try and regulate and police trade into and out, find out who the end user was in purchaser, who was transacting it. And they couldn't do it then, with all the resources of the state right there and there and then ready. Um, but, um, and so now we want to start trying to uh, um, uh, look at things subsequently from 19, uh, you know, 100 years later. It's extremely difficult because the business records are destroyed. Um, there was a regulatory body in British government called the Cornhill Committee, which was uh, this body of, um, um, it's a body of uh, bankers and businessmen. Uh, and they basically, were, they were set up by the British government as a self-regulatory watchdog to oversee British trade, particularly the banks, and uh, which didn't work out too well. Well, they were remarkably honest men, but uh, let's just say they compiled a huge quantity of insider information on uh, all these companies and how they operated. And uh, you know, if the war ends at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, then within 11 minutes later, this entire record was burnt. They destroyed the lot. Um, and uh, why? Because it was too much embarrassing material. And most of it, um, I, again, I, 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 I'll, I'll, I can tell you an amusing story maybe afterwards, uh, but uh, all this was destroyed. 
And then uh, by sheer fluke, I came across this trunk uh, with top copies for the, uh, the reports, um, um, for the meetings for the first six months. And the names they name is literally a who's who in British business. And they're, 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 they're the position papers are in there, and the, uh, I wouldn't say the evidence, but the, uh, the, the uh, circumstantial evidence that uh, needs to be addressed is detailed. And everybody, it's the same everyone. They had French companies, they had American companies, everybody's at it. Okay, uh, George Holdeman, Mascuda High School, Mascuda, Illinois. Um, based on what you said about the effects of blockades around nations um, and the effectiveness of that, like U.S. trade to Europe and the Britain trade throughout their empires, uh, as a form of you know warfare aimed at you know destructuralizing their economies, I'm wondering how effective you also think that was towards maybe um, decolonization after World War One. Uh, as you know, many of the, the trade you know, from Britain was not able to get out to their economies in or out. Ah, well, it's an important qualifier. The economic warfare strategy they had for the first few weeks of the war was incredibly effective. The improvised blockade was incredibly ineffective. I mean, everything was pouring into Germany through the neutrals. Um, and um, yes, there was an object lesson in that. The, um, uh, that would be... Uh, a very difficult question to answer. I mean, I, I think everybody knew it wasn't very effective, although for political and propaganda purposes, they had to argue it was. Um, arguably, the, any blockade of Germany only really becomes effective once the United States enter the war, and even then, six months later, because it took a good six months to persuade American businesses that they really still couldn't trade with uh, you know, the enemy. Uh, and British and French governments had just the same problems. Uh, business didn't really see what the war had to do with them. So, um, in which case, then the war is over remarkably quickly, uh, which isn't to say there wasn't an impact inside of Germany, but uh, uh, I, they hesitated to draw lessons. I mean, one of the justifications, you know, what, uh, the League of Nations, what is the great instrument that they had great faith in as their, uh, you know, their what was the, their, their one weapon that the League of Nations post-war was supposed to wield was sanctions. They believed that they could pressure and um, modify uh, the behavior of certain nation states using sanctions. So there was this belief there. But uh, how successful were the imposition of sanctions in the 20s and 30s? I think that answers the question. Um, yeah, and I'm not sure really, um, I'm not sure really, I mean, I think different interest groups probably make different arguments, but it was a convenient brick to hurl at somebody sometimes, uh, and you can have just about any interpretation of the effectiveness or lack thereof. And uh, then the question becomes, well, it may have been ineffective. It was only ineffective because X. So if we don't do X, then it'll work. But then there was no agreement as to what and where and why for. It was, it was, uh, it was a very, very, very political issue uh, post-war, um, the whole question of economic pressure and sanctions. It also got mixed up with the whole question of ethics of war and uh, the barbarism of war. Um, it was a very dangerous weapon to play and uh, to utilize. We have time for one more question and we'll give it to uh, Paul Dickwood. I just wondered why you stressed the uh, recession of 1914 so much in, in terms of overall impact compared to others. For the United States, you know, 57, 73, 1893, 1907, 1929 all seem like much more significant ones, other than the Federal Reserve System getting a kickstart by the um, downturn in business activity. I do it because of the impact it potentially, I mean, they really take in countervailing action. The US is going to take in counter action, countervailing action very quickly and very decisively and moving very quickly. And they uh, really, the, the point is, is they perceive the necessity to do this and um, you know, act ruthlessly. I mean, they really are. Um, um, excuse me, I'm very concerned about a collapse in the banking system. I mean, really what happens, I mean, the U.S. is a detonation, nation. And uh, what is the impact upon the U.S. dollar in uh, <coughs> July, August 1914? You can't sell dollars. Nobody wants them. Um, it goes to, what, $6, the exchange rate does. Uh, exchange breaks down. Uh, and what is the consequence of that? And the U.S. is a debtor nation. I mean, they owe hundreds of millions of dollars to overseas uh, countries. You know, in fact, what does Britain do in 1914? They send a mission, a page mission, over to the United States to renegotiate American debt. 
Uh, and if they really wanted to push the matter, they could have forced the United States off the gold standard. And if they had forced the US off the gold standard, what would the consequences have been? And then when we, do we want to start going back into you know, Sherman silver and you know, bimetallism? And this is a, a, a very sensitive uh, monetary policy. It's a very sensitive political issue. And there are deep schisms within both parties, are there not, as to the wisdom or of going with gold versus gold versus silver. And they're not that far distant. And so really, do you want to really um, you know, cause an implosion of the US banking system? Do you want to, uh, you know, and they're already in a depression. And what is the impact upon uh, you know, the US South and cotton? I mean, the entire US South, including all the banks, is totally dependent upon cotton, and they're totally dependent upon the export of cotton. Um, I'm just saying is, is that yes, in terms of the actual, uh, I would agree with you, the, 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 the impact of you know, 1893 is far, far worse, yes? But um, the potentiality of the crisis, I think, uh, there is a perception that it's going to be even worse than that. I mean, it's, uh, it's no accident that, uh, um, um, you know, I, I put Armageddon in the title. If you read all the diaries, sometimes everybody talks about Armageddon. This is what they're fearing, a complete breakdown in the international trading system. And then what happens? And then uh, it's, uh, never mind bombing back to the Stone Age, uh, it's worse. Everyone gets starved, millions are going to die. So you feel this was, uh, was more severe than, say, 2008's economic break? I think, so, yes. I mean, it depends, of course, how you measure. But, you know, what's the first British action in August 1914? They underwrite all bills of exchange for all trade around the world. In the process, they increase the national, British national debt or the liability by 80% which makes the bailout of the mortgage companies in 08 rather small change, doesn't it, as a percentage? But they had to do that, and they could, what is it, pledge the credit to the British state, and it was plausible. Uh, Britain had a relatively low national debt in those days, but they had to, and these were, these were deemed to be extreme measures, and uh, you know, they're violations of God knows how many long cherished political principles and theories of economics and liberal thought. I mean, they just, uh, it's the speed at which they're taking these decisions I find extraordinary. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, join me in thanking Nick Lambert. Thank you. Very good.